Okay. Okay, we're live, and the topic of the the topic of the discussion today is health freedom. Obviously, this is a hangout with Dr. Doug Graham, and we're going to be talking on the the subject of health freedom. If anyone wants to join, has any questions, please leave questions in the chat box, or you can put them on Facebook or message me, and we'll answer those questions or I'll pass those questions on and if anyone actually joins the hangout you can we'd ask you to mute your if you're not muted automatically just please mute your screen uh, and then if you wish to talk or ask a question become part of the discussion then we can add you we can add you on take you off mute so we're just going to wait for a few minutes and allow some people to to join and uh, Doug, how are you today? How's everything going for you? Today's a great day. Uh, <laughs> you said I, you got you said you got a lot done today. It was an incredibly busy day. Yeah, there was a lot to do. I'm, I'm I try to do everything that I always do these days, uh, which sometimes is more challenging just to get everything done that I usually get done. But also, I'm in the midst of writing a book that I'm. I'm, I'm committed to completing by the end of the year, and in order to do that, I have to stay on schedule. So I have to write every single day, you know, a certain amount, and in order, and I never know how long that's going to take. It's I don't do it by time; I do it by words, and so I have to get a certain amount done. And sometimes it just takes longer, but um, there were a few little complications today with my with my puppy <coughs> that ended up taking an extra hour or two out of my day right but yeah real busy day I, I i love all the things that make it full you know making making food for my family is a big a big thing for me i enjoy doing that and i want to make it special um a it's a holiday and b my girls have been away for a few days so tonight they'll be home for dinner and yep. i wanted it to be special for them Excellent. So, you would you say that writing takes up a lot of your your work time? Is that a lot of what you do? Is writing, researching? How how does that divide up? It's a funny thing. If I'm writing on something, I'm only writing about five hundred words a day. Right. Which isn't which isn't much. I mean, figure the average sentence runs seven to ten words. So, you know, you're talking 50 sentences. It's only a couple paragraphs. And if I'm writing on something that I've researched previously or spoken about previously, then I know what I want to say and I just say it. But the nature of this particular book is it's almost all material that I haven't written on before. Right almost all or if it's something that i've written on before it's either new insights or more depth or off in another direction on that topic but you know just another angle and so i mean sometimes i spend two or three days researching a sentence <laughs> it's not you know i mean if i wish it was just more straightforward than that but it's not so people say, how long does it take? And it takes as long as it takes. It really, sometimes it takes a long time to write a sentence. And to get it, my experience has been that a lot of people misunderstand other people. I'm included in that. You know, you kind of, you hear things through your own filter and, and you interpret what they meant based on the way you hear it yeah. and it might be what they meant but it might not be especially if you don't know the person all that well um, if it's a written word you didn't hear the you didn't hear it um, you know the, you didn't hear the intonation if it's a if it's just one sentence or a part of a sentence and it's taking taken out of context so my experience has been a lot of people misunderstand what I say and write sure 
which motivates me to attempt to be even more clear all the time. So I'll read a I'll write a sentence and then read it and then rewrite it and then read it and rewrite it and then read it out loud and then write it again and and then change the word change a word here and there or flip the whole thing around the other way so that it's grammatically a little better. Um, I do spend a fair amount of time kind of as a, a wordsmith. Yep. Yeah, so just, just to let everyone know, we're just waiting for more people to filter on and, and watch and everything. And if you want to ask any questions, there should be the chat box at the side if you're logged in through Google. Uh, or you can post on the Facebook forum. I'll keep checking that, the forum for the event uh, today. And the topic is health freedom. So we're going to speak about, or Doug's going to speak about that. I'm going to be asking the questions pulling out some interesting answers, asking them some things that maybe you don't get asked too often, hopefully, and pulling out some some insights to help everyone out in their health journey today. So here we are, we're seven minutes in. So how about we just we start from now? I think it's a good I, time. You know, I'm, I'm a big one on starting on time. Yeah. I, I so, like to start on time. So when I when I mentioned to you about the idea of doing a doing a hangout today, you you came up with the idea of health freedom. And what do you mean by that when you say health freedom? What does that bring to your mind? For me, health freedom means that I have, I have the power, the decision-making power, uh, to take care of myself and, and the ability to take care of others if need be. Um, as opposed to people telling me, well, you have to take this drug for the rest of your life, or you need this procedure, or, you know, the other stated, well, I used to be able to do this, that, or the other, but I don't have the whatever it is anymore. And, and so to me, health, health freedom is, is simply about being a, a fully functional member of society and, and being able to function at function at at the highest level that I can at the moment and continually expecting to grow in those capabilities mm -hmm. so I mean the obvious don't get sick um, reminds me of the old Jack Duntrop book you don't have to be sick but um, you know, and he was writing about health freedom as well. I mean, the hygienists have always talked about the idea that health is your greatest wealth. And, and without your health, you simply aren't free to do anything else that might be interesting to you. I mean, I, personally, taking care of my health isn't a time consumer. I don't, think, I don't put time into my health regimen. I don't, it, it doesn't require almost anything I do isn't it isn't like well i've got this health regimen that i go through that takes time um i like to sleep at night and that's part of my health regimen I, I i'm active most days and that's part of my health regimen but i'm active because i like to be active and because i can be active and, and not because i have to be and so i have the the freedom of choice and and i like that i like that i prefer that I don't think I'm different than most people in that I don't really enjoy being told what to do. I mean, if I'm there to assist somebody and I don't know what to do, well, then I want them to tell me. But I even have that choice to do that. But in terms of taking care of myself, I want to decide. I don't want to say, oh, well, I have to do this. And I, you know, I begrudge the fact that it takes me X amount of time to deal with some medical issue or another um, every day you know you have to clean out your stoma or something and I don't want to be in such a position yeah and when we apply that idea to raw food I think a lot of people well I've heard the claims that the raw food diet or the 8 to 10 10 program that it's time consuming that it's people who do these things are obsessive people talk about the, the word orthorexia 
uh, and all, almost that it would be the opposite of freedom because you're getting shackled into a kind of dogma and and as if that's causing more stress than the benefit of eating a raw diet would 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 help with so what's your thoughts on that kind of claim of it of there being a lot of neg like these kind of negatives that people seem to say well i think everybody's entitled to their opinion if you will uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody to, that they need to do what I what I do, and I'm not going to tell anybody if what they're doing is right or wrong for them. Uh, orthorexia is a specific obsession, and and the obsession happens to be revolving around food and eating and other aspects of your health regimen might or you know this includes uh obsessive exercising as well but um or even some obsessive cleaning <laughs> and but it's the obsession the problem is the obsession right not the fact that you eat well <clears throat> if you choose to eat fruits and vegetables and you're not obsessed about it then you don't have orthorexia. Yeah. You just choose to eat fruits and vegetables. Uh, I, you know, the, if you ask the people who do smoke cigarettes, they, uh, they're not really trying to convince everybody else that they should smoke cigarettes. They just want to be able to smoke and be left alone. <laughs> um, I can understand that. And I'm not picking on smokers. Although they are a dying breed, <laughs> but the people who are doing recreational drugs, they're not necessarily. I I haven't been faced very many times in my whole life with people telling me that I need to do recreational drugs along with them. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't know why it is exactly that we get so attached to our food issues. But, you know, if people think that they don't want to eat fruits and vegetables, well, I think that's, that's fine. They don't, they don't have to. Um, but there are consequences to every action we do. If somebody asked me the other day on my blog if, uh, if eating raw was really that big a deal or, you know, is eating cooked food have any, any downsides to it, then... You know, I realized right away this isn't somebody who's read the 80-10-10 diet or listened to any of my nutritional lectures, but, you know, there, if I could eat cooked food and it wasn't going to hurt me or the planet, I would. But I have, I have a conscience towards the planet and I have respect for my own body and I have requirements that I want from my own body in terms of performance. I know I'm not going to live forever, but while I'm here, I want to be able to function and I want to be able to function well for as long as I can. I don't know how long that's going to be. You know, right now I'm still making progress in, in various fitness goals. I'm still making progress with my writing. I'm able to think clearly. And, and I can't blame raw foods or credit raw sure. foods for all that but i but i remember why i switched away from cooked foods because they weren't getting me where i wanted to go and i remember the profound change that happened when i went raw and the profound change that happened when i went 80 10 10 you know when i found what worked i'm going to keep working it and if other people have found things that work for them well by all means let them keep working it most people end up at least looking at 80 10 10 specifically because what they are doing isn't working and i understand that a lot of people eat 80 10 10 for a while and then they want to check out cooked food or then they want to check out other foods or they want to check out eggs or they want to whatever it is <laughs> and 
and they forget, you know, they forget why they stopped eating eggs. It's easy to do. I mean, heck, we do this with relationships. How many times have you heard about people who broke up with somebody and then got back together with them and then broke up with them again and then got back together with them? I mean, I've met people who married the same person three times. You know, married, divorced, married, divorced, married a third time to the same person. I guess that's what they had to go through. Um and I don't know which they were supposed to remember, why they got married or why they got divorced. <laughs> you know, but for me, I, I find the effort is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is be sick. Being sick is challenging. I do not enjoy my time when I'm ill. I just, I become nonproductive. I hurt. I get fearful. To some degree, I, I, you know, productivity is is matters to me. Being useful to my family matters. They get concerned that they're not used to seeing me down. Um, I don't want to. I don't enjoy being ill. To me, that's that's really hard. Eating well isn't hard. I mean, I don't know. I can eat fifteen bananas in fifteen minutes. For people to go out for a fast food meal, it takes them 15 minutes just to get to the restaurant, order their food, and have it handed to them. <laughs> By the time they've got it handed to them, I've already finished my meal. <laughs> so I don't think in terms of time, anything, any diet, any food program can take time. There's a way to eat what's called gourmet where you spend more time on preparation than you do in the actual eating of the food in fact typically the more time you spend on prep the less time is required in the eating because you you know you're cutting it and the more the more you cut it all that mechanical digestion goes on up front yeah so you can do that with fruits and vegetables too. You can get very time consuming meals that are very time consuming to prepare. But I mean, I, I've served meals for 15 people where I just take seven watermelons, cut them in half and share them around. And how long does it take to cut a watermelon in half? There was no, there was virtually no prep and there's no cleanup. You just throw the rind off of the, compost heap and wash the spoon I guess maybe rinse the spoon that was time consuming but yeah but I've also prepared meals where it took four hours per person I, I did one meal once in my life that took it took eight hours per person to prepare the meal it was a meal for 10 people it took us 80 hours of prep we had 10, we had eight people on staff that day and we all worked 10 hours and it was a big day, but it was a heck of a meal. You know, it was a, it was a memorable meal. The people who ate that meal, what people who prepared it still remember vividly. So what, what was that? What was that meal? I mean, what? Can you have any memories of how many courses it was? Or yeah, memory of it. I, my memory was it was a five-course meal. Um, I could probably go look up in my records somewhere what we actually served that day, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it started with drinks, it, and the drinks were a little more complicated than just straight orange juice. Um, you know, there was chopped up berries or crushed berries, and still, it's relatively simple drinks. Um, but you know, when you put when you're making enough mangoes for sixteen people to fit that into the drinks and you know, you got to prep the mangoes up. Everything just takes time. Um, there were hors d'oeuvres that were basically things on cocktail toothpicks. So, again, it was fine cut, but you could just take a toothpick and it has some pineapple chunks and some mango chunks and 
we had a few other we, had, we were down in the tropics at the time so we had access to a few other tropical fruits and we just put all that stuff on there and make these lovely hors d'oeuvres um a lot of them were the same things but not on a stick but just layered one on top of another and you just grab a stack and put it in and um same thing it was a, a very straightforward tomato type soup but with enough enough um vegetables prepared into something that i call confetti <laughs> there's a lot of confetti in the soup and, um, and then there were i'm not even sure exactly what to call them but we took some vegetables and and put them into a mold and and made a shape it was a diamond shape actually a, a, a three-dimensional diamond right so it was flat and it, it laid flat and then it was a diamond and then you could take that crushed vegetable matter and put it in in the middle of the soup as a decoration it would just sit on top of the soup because the soup was thick enough with all that confetti so you could then stick a solid shape onto it and um, it just endlessly went on like that there, the salad was layered not quite a lasagna but very much a layered salad and it was served as a layered salad and and again it, this has to be cut fairly fine in order for it not to uh just come apart in the eating process it's eaten pretty much like a lasagna but it didn't have any any noodle feel to it all it's truly a layered salad um and i i have to think a minute to tell you what the last course was i'm not sure but there was a final course I, I i believe it was some kind of a slaw and a cabbage thing with pineapple and i'm not sure what else but i won't i won't i can't i just can't picture it off the top of my head right now what we did for that last course but it took it took time i mean the whole yeah. thing by the time it, it was, and it was served in a very luxurious way you know we set the room up to be luxurious so uh, there was only eight people coming to dinner so we set four tables into four different rooms turned one room into four big room turn one big room into four little rooms and then just put small tables in so that people could sit two to a room and not not know anybody else was there basically they had their own room to eat in it was it was really it was sweet so it took <laughs> The, the food prep itself probably only took 60 hours. The last 20 hours was designing the decor. Yeah. You know, between music and smell and light and building walls, temporary walls for just for that evening. And Can I just stop you there? Because that's something that you seem to be really into is this idea of building ambiance and that's i've heard people talking about that at, uh, from your events the idea that that's part of the culinary skills week and things like that is this idea of, of the atmosphere the presentation this is all part of the the thing of serving food to people well i, I mean you know if you have a choice between sitting in a really nice place or sitting in mcdonald's to eat your meal i mean we know ambiance does matter Certainly anybody who attended last year's Saturday night dinner at, at the UK Fruit Festival, I mean, the ambiance was spectacular. And even though it was one big room, it was still spectacular, you know, and you felt, you felt the effect of ambiance being created just for that night. It, it was sure. nothing like the other meals. And... And it was supposed to be that way and we all everybody appreciated it and and i'm still bumping into people who are talking about that saturday night dinner at the fruit festival last year <laughs> and there's none of the other i mean none of the other festivals really go to that length that's that's something that comes from food and sports staff yeah i think that's true um and just for people, just very quickly, we're not going to speak too much about the event right now, but the UK Fruit Fest is 
Doug will be coming there uh, in about a month's time. It's actually it's about a month from now that it starts, and uh, there's a lot. There's a few spaces left. Last few spaces. If you want to go to the website, register tonight. The prices are going up tonight, so please go and register soon to make sure you get a get a space. But maybe speak a bit about that later as well. But I want to I want to go back to this article. Sorry, a blog that you wrote. And, and probably a lot of people don't know about your powerlifting. You started competing in powerlifting, I believe, a couple of years ago. Uh, I had a, a chance when I was down in your area to train with the people you train with and watch watch what your training programs like. And you've written an article or, or your blog about your uh, your powerlifting competition that you went to and. I'll just read out this part that I liked where you say, we humans are creatures of habit, creatures of routine. And the trick to a good competition day is to make it as much like any other day as possible. Our neuroplasticity is surprisingly limited. Take us out of our usual routine and our train of thought wanders. We can very easily and quickly find ourselves befuddled, confused, and even panicked. And I thought that that applied not just for the training of any sport, but for someone who's starting a, a health program or starting the 80 10 10 diet or whatever, having some building some routines that work for them, I imagine that's maybe quite an important part of it. And I wonder if you if you could speak a bit about your routines, and and we'll speak about the powerlifting as well. But what are some of your uh, weekly, daily routines to help you? manage your diet as easily as possible it's i mean to me this is a fascinating field i i, I see the application in that writing in everything we do everywhere we go all the time sure so i mean you can look at it in the world of sport and watch I don't know if you've been taking in any Wimbledon yet, but if you've been watching any of the Wimbledon and you see people who who are in situations they've never been in before, right. and for instance, in the last couple of days, there's been a couple of people who weren't in the top 100 playing against people who were in the top 20. Yeah. And, and doing really well until the pressure mounted up into situations that they just they weren't used to ever it, it was a first time for them where they were seeing things that they'd never seen before um, whether that meant being on being on the the main court or whether it meant yeah. you know the pressure that the other player could put against them and all of a sudden their game just breaks down and the stuff that they usually do so well against lesser players it it fell apart everything everything was hitting just outside the lines instead of just inside the lines and we see it you know i mean you're driving along being the, a good driver and everything's going great but when the policeman stops you and starts asking you questions <laughs> you know your heart rate goes like crazy and or if you're if you're going from country to country and you have to go through immigration and they start asking right. you questions and and all of a sudden you go and, and they go, so where were you? When was the last time you left the country? And, and you go, um, I, I, you know, and you get, you can, yeah. you get, I've seen people get very, very flustered. And you see a lot of times people on stage giving presentations and they're fine with the presentation as long as they don't get asked any questions. Because <laughs> um, they're not, they're not really used to thinking yeah. in that situation well it's something that i never understood when i was watching sports and i would hear the commentators or the the ex-professional athletes say you know this player's never played on center court as you're saying and then it's therefore it'll favor the player that's that's played there before it'll favor the person that's been in the final before it'll favor the person who's got home advantage that i never understood why a team playing at home had the advantage that never that never made sense to me. So I guess it's what you're saying is that familiarity allows them to perform better than the person who's coming in with an added factor of 
unfamiliarity that they're having to compete against, I guess. Unfamiliarity really throws you off. I mean, if you're going somewhere for the first time, it can seem like a really long trip. And then when you go to do that same trip the 10th time or the 20th time, I mean, you hardly even think about it. And, you know, and it's over in no time. And, you know, it goes really quickly. But at first it can seem like it just took so long to get there. Uh, you're, you're, you, go in, you can go into panic mode really quickly. Um, the idea of neuroplasticity is a, is a big deal for me. I want to practice being in situations that require me to be more plastic. Uh, I don't want to get so set in my ways, but I also want to practice for whatever might come up and be ready to handle whatever might come up. As far as powerlifting, I mean, I don't think it's a, it's special in any way more than other sports. When people ask me what's my favorite activity, I've always said whatever one I happen to be doing at the moment. And I, I enjoy all I enjoy fitness activities. I enjoy play. I enjoy physical fun um, of pretty much every kind. I've never boxed, but I think I might. I think I might enjoy it as long as the other guy wasn't trying to kill me. <laughs> boxing for maybe for for talent rather than for injury. Yeah. yeah. But um, but I have fenced and I enjoyed the heck out of fencing, which I think fencing and boxing are very closely related. Sure. You know, I, and fence it, but in fencing you're not going to get you're not going to get your brains knocked in. So hopefully, but. My first competition was less than a year ago. My first competition, I, I never I never took up powerlifting for competition. Uh, what became obvious to me, though, was that I was either going to get weaker in the next decade or I was going to get stronger. And, and given those two options, I had to choose stronger. So I took up powerlifting. I met some guys. Fortunately, I met some guys who were really good at it. And... And they set a very high standard in their training. Um, they've taught me in a way so that I understand, you know, I already understood the importance of mechanics and I've always taught about sports mechanics. And, and they're, they're really strong guys from what I... They're really... <laughs> they're internationally ranked guys. I mean, right. they're, they're not just ranked in England. Um, one of them is probably going to be... The, at the upcoming... The next net British Championships, the guy that's coaching me is he's either going to be first in the nation or second. But I'm rooting for first. I think he's got a good chance at first. It's it's going to be tight. You know, I'm um, one of the other guys that is there um, that introduced me to this sport. He's he's fourth in the world in his group. Wow. Know? So, I mean, these these guys are good. And and I got into it just to, because I didn't want to get weaker. I wanted to get stronger. And because of the challenge it poses, it's unlike anything I've ever done before in that, in that it's just a, it's a moment. It's a fraction of a second. But you really have to pay attention for that fraction of a second. And uh, it would be so easy to quit. Right. You know, you know I don't want to quit. Um, you mentioned in, you mentioned in your blog that you were you were lifting and you thought you'd got the lift and then you it pulled you forward slightly. Uh yeah, at the last competition I was at, I, as the weights go heavier, you know, and you've got it up on your shoulders, it, it can drive you forward if you don't resist against it doing that. And and I lifted ninety just fine, and I lifted a hundred just fine, and then I jumped up to one ten, and I, I've only done one ten rarely in my life but i figured i'd give it a shot and it didn't feel that heavy i felt quite capable of doing the weight but i let it get away from me and that i let it drive me forward once it drives you forward i mean you're in serious trouble and um, fortunately there's enough spotters there to make sure that it's a safe sport they took the weight right off my sh basically the rule is as soon as the weight stops moving up they come and they right. come and help me. So as I moved forward, the weight began to move down, and they just took it right off my shoulders. 
Uh, I wouldn't have gotten hurt, and I may or may not have lifted the weight, but I'd already broken the rules, so it didn't matter at that point. I'll get it next time. Yeah. I will get it next time. I'm confident that I'll get that and more in the future. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Um, the fun thing about powerlifting I'm finding is that the expectations are very cut and dry. I mean, this is a sport where, you know, it's black and white, the numbers. What do you weigh? How much weight you lift? It's it's not like, well, was that a good dive or not? Well, it's up to the aesthetic appeal of the, you know, the training of different judges looking for different things. This is strict. This is very cut and dry. You either lift the weight or you don't. And it's, it's totally strength to weight ratio because you're competing against people who are in your weight class. Um, but the expectations are that up until about age 40, you're going to get stronger. Uh -huh. And then from age 40 on, you're going to start getting weaker. Yeah. And so at my, at my weight class, which is anybody under 74 kilos, um, so in my weight class, whereas a, a 35 year old would be expected to lift, I don't know, I think it's like, I think it's somewhere around 470 kilos as a combined lift for bench squat and deadlift. Um, in order to qualify for the competition as a 50 year old, you're only expected to lift around 410. Um, yeah. As a 60 year old, they're only asking me to lift 330 in order to qualify. But so far in the five years since I first began the lifting, the amount that I can lift has gone up every year and it's still going up. So at some point, maybe it will stop, I guess, but right now it's still going up. I talked with, I talked with the Washington State champion in, in bench press last year. He was 77 years old and he says he's still getting stronger every year. So, so there's not a limit. Do you, is there not a, a a point at which you can't you reach your genetic potential or anything like that? Or I mean, well, because it's a new sport to me, reaching my genetic potential is going to take some time. Okay. But and then you need to take steroids, or <laughs> I don't think there's going to come a time where I need to take steroids. <laughs> but maybe you mean in order to keep lifting heavier. Um, In interesting science has shown that people in their 90s who begin a strength training program get stronger, mm -hmm. even in their 90s. Um, if they take up strength training, they will get stronger. The question is, for how long, you know, and, and am I going to just plateau or am I going to be able to keep making gains? I hope to keep making gains while the guys in my age group keep losing ground. And I'm going to attribute that to 80-10-10 at that point that, you know, I've got sports longevity on my side, but sure. I still have mental clarity on my side. I'm going to attribute that to 80-10-10 um, because there's just not – I mean, I'm seeing it. There's a lot of people who just don't have it anymore. By the yeah. time – I'm not old by any stretch, but had it been 20 years ago – somebody my age would have been considered quite old. So, hello, we got somebody in. Um, so it's a fun sport, but any, any sport's fun. It's one I've never done. And so it, it was really, it's been, it's been quite an adventure to take on something yeah. new. And that, that's really a pleasure. But it's also very challenging, and it's one that I know I can do for as long as I care to do it, you know, it's definitely a lifetime sport lifting. Okay, I've, I've, we've got a question that's coming for you, and this is from uh, Jeanette Turner, and Jeanette is going to be joining us at the fruit festival in, in a month's time uh, at the UK Fruit Fest, and she said, "This this is something that comes up a lot, but worth going over. Can you ask Doug how to succeed at gaining 
freedom from addiction to cooked food to stop me self-sabotaging my efforts. I struggle to keep raw. When I fail, I cook and eat portions of cooked food which are much too large and then seriously feel ill and regret it afterwards. I'm struggling to break this cycle. Do you have any insights there for Jeanette? Well, thanks Jeanette for, for writing in that question. Um, I don't know how long you've been with us, but it's something I actually already talked about a little while ago and I will gladly do again. Uh, the first thing I think is memory. You have to you have to remember why raw food seemed appealing to you in the first place. And if you don't remember why, uh, or if, you, if you're the kind of person who tends to forget why, then you need to write it down and put it in places that you're going to see it that are meaningful to you, like on your refrigerator door or things like that, on your bathroom scale and your bathroom mirror and, and everywhere else. Uh, to remind you why, um, because in the same way that if you're in a relation, if you're in a relationship with somebody, and you used to be in a relationship with somebody else, uh, you got to remember why did that first relationship end, and you also have to remember why you want to, what you have to do in order to stay in the current relationship. And it's the same with food. You got to remember why did that old relationship end? You know, what was it about cooked food that you felt motivated you to move away from it, to move on from it? And what motivated you to move towards raw food? But really the, the biggest, easiest solution to eating raw is eating raw food. You got to eat a lot of it. If you don't eat enough of it, you will eat something else. You will be driven to it. And there will be certain times when you're more driven than others. There could be emotional triggers. Um, there could be tiredness triggers. There could be stress triggers. There could be, there could be any number of things, you know, travel triggers, uh, going back home, you know, family triggers. There can be a lot of things. It could be monkey see, monkey do. You just see cooked food, and so then you want to eat it because that's how we are with food. Uh, we see food, and we want to eat it. Yeah, at some point, you get to a point where you stop thinking of that stuff as food, and then you realize you've gotten over a major hurdle. But you're, I mean, basically, it's funny with food. Um, you know, if you're full, you don't want to eat. But when you're hungry, you really do want to eat. And if you're hungry enough, you don't even care what you'll eat. You just want to eat. So my recommendation is to make sure you're, you're satisfied with your food. you got to eat enough of it. And because we were raised on cooked food and the portion control that goes into the logic and the mindset of somebody eating cooked food, is so different than that of somebody eating raw food. I mean, you know, when I when I make a salad for just me for dinner, I use a bowl that's bigger than most people would use for a family of six or eight. Mm. I would say probably a family of eight. It's more salad than a family of eight would eat on most nights of the week. But not on raw food. On raw food, we've got to eat some volume. When I sit down to eat bananas, and, and I mean, I had bananas every day this week. So that, so that was, a, that was a, pretty, that's a pretty consistent part of your program a lot of the time is bananas for lunch or breakfast? Bananas, bananas for lunch, but right now we just happen to have a lot of bananas ripening up, so right. I'm eating them. And I'm not trying to pig out on bananas. And they're not huge bananas, uh, but I have I haven't I'm pretty much eaten about 20, 22 a day. You know, just sit down, eat twenty two bananas. I don't think about food again for four or five hours. Yeah, and I sure as heck don't want to eat any cooked food after I've had all those bananas. 
Um, typically, you're going to be driven to eat food um, if you don't eat enough fruit, primarily. You got to get your calories in, not just the volume, but you got to get the calories in. And although you say driven to eat cooked food, I'd be willing to wager with you that although we haven't you know discussed this previously just came in as a question I'd be willing to make the wager that it's either bread rice pasta corn or potatoes that it's some kind of a complex carb that you tend to eat a lot of now maybe you put some fat on it or maybe you put some salt on it or something but you're not actually just going for like butter or <laughs> deep fried fish um, you know you, that you're going for starch uh, whether it's bread rice pasta corn potatoes whatever starch is it is your choice but if I can get feedback on that the reason we eat starch I just wrote about this and it's in my upcoming book actually it's what I was writing about yesterday is the reason we eat starch is because we haven't eaten enough fresh fruit you got to eat some serious volume of fresh fruit if you don't get enough if you don't get enough calories from the simple carbohydrates in fruit, you will go to the complex calories, complex carb calories that you get from starch. Yeah. So uh, I hope you'll write back to us with a little bit of, you know, another comment besides just the question. Because if I'm completely off, well, then maybe it's a different answer. But my guess is you're going towards starch. And the reason you do is because you're not eating enough fruit. Well, I, cer I certainly think from my, when I started to go, raw and uh, I remember after I'd, I'd been experimenting with a long time then I went to the Woodstock Fruit Festival about four years ago and I wanted to just keep going from that point on and I, I, I remember looking I'm not as strict now I, I think I, I think I should be actually I think getting more of a routine would be better for me but I remember very uh, routinely getting enough bananas consistently always having a smoothie made in the morning when i was going to work or even sometimes the night before which obviously probably isn't as good because the smoothie's sitting for a while but for me having as you're saying that kind of quantity of bananas 20 or so uh, prepared in a smoothie or however having that ready having that there having that for my lunch meal uh, breakfast lunch that seems to really set you up well for the rest of the day to help because as you're saying when you start to under eat you start to make choices that you're you're kind of finding excuses to make i i feel you, you can easily start to find excuses to eat higher fat or you know under eat not realize you're under eating and, and these kind of things so I, I certainly think the routine of getting enough calories for that first meal of the day uh, helps a lot of people. And and some people aren't going for the, the maybe don't realize how much, as you're saying, the volume that's required to get that in. I mean, I want to eat enough. I want to eat enough at the meal so that I'm just not even thinking about food for another four or five hours. Sure. For my meal. And I can pretty well gauge how much I'm going to have to eat in order to know when am I, you know. I, yeah. That takes practice, though. That took experience. It took experience with cooked food, too, to know whether you needed one slice of pizza, three slices of pizza, five slices of pizza. You know, I mean, I, it took practice to know how many slices of pizza would it take until you were going to be satisfied until your next meal. Yeah. Uh, and it takes the same thing with blueberries and it takes the same thing with bananas and it's it's a learning curve that technically it was something we were supposed to learn as children but <laughs> we didn't have that opportunity so now as adults we have to learn that and i think the the trick is being kind enough to ourselves when we when we when things don't go exactly according to plan and you just get back on the horse learn from the experience and and continue with your efforts to get it the way you want it to be. Yeah. I've got another question uh, come from Harriet. Um, 
she's asking, is it okay to eat just bananas and celery if I really enjoy them at every meal? Uh, I have an eight-week intensive training period for a long run, but I feel like just eating bananas and celery. Um, what's 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 your thoughts on that? Just that combination, bananas and celery, for eight weeks. I don't, you know what we're what we're. First of all, yes, it's perfectly safe, Harriet. And and you know when you're coming from a from a relatively healthy position. I know you're trying to get in a lot of celery as well. You want to get your carbs in. Um, it's a it's a nice mix. There's a lot of different ways to do that. You may find after a while that you've come to absolutely love it, or you may find after a while that you don't want to see another banana. You might get to a point where you get sort of an anesthetic feel um, where you you don't even like the thought of another banana or the taste of celery, it may start to turn you off. Uh, but likely for eight weeks, you could, you could go that long without it being that big a deal. Two, three weeks, no problem. Um, as you find with most fitness training routines, you know, people make fitness goals for the year and then they stick with those resolutions on average for four days <laughs> when when world-class athletes make training schedules they make four different training schedules for the year um, so that they're they're never going more than about 12 weeks on one part of the program before they get to the next part and the next part and it changes up and they might have a they might have a basic conditioning section and they might have an endurance section and they might have a strength section and then a competitive schedule section uh, because biting off more than about 12 weeks at a time for them is is just doesn't tend to work very well to take on a 16 or an 18 or 26 week goal uh, for myself, I've, I've found that I can do a 12-week schedule, but I have to really be focused on it. It has to really be laid out. And by the end, and, and I can only do it well if it has some kind of a break at midpoint, some sort of, some sort of a reward in the middle of it. And so I, I tend to work pretty well with a six-week program or somewhere around there. And, and I can do two in a row that are similar but then I want to get into something that changes it up in some way. And, um, and the same thing with food. I, I'm reminded of a man. I had a visitor come to me. He's an English citizen, but he was, he was born in India, raised in India till his teens. And he came to my house in, in Florida at, at the height of our mango season. And he said, you know, I asked him if there was anything special that he wanted. Before he came, we talked, and he goes, um, if you have any mangoes, he'd really appreciate it. Mangoes are his favorite food, and he remembers being a boy in India when mangoes were so so ever-present, and, and he can't get mangoes like that uh, in England. And, you know, if I have access, I told him I have access to great mangoes in South Florida, it's just it's the home of the mango, really. There's more mango varieties been invented in South Florida uh, than the rest of the world combined. So we have some excellent access to mangoes. Sure. Uh, I said, well, what do you want? He goes, I, I just want mangoes. <laughs> and so, you know, we gave him mango shakes and mango pudding and mango ice cream and, and mangoes with raspberries and... and um, some straight mango things and you know we served him mangoes for three days he was he was going to be at my house for a week and i was prepared for him i had mango varieties he'd never tasted before i had some indian mango varieties he, he was he was in mango heaven on the on the breakfast of the third day he said do you think it would be possible to have something other than mangoes for lunch <laughs> i said you can have whatever you want. What would you like? He said, it would be really nice to have maybe pita bread and almond butter. 
I said, if that's what you want to have, of course. I mean, you know, you're a guest in my home. You can have what you want to have. So eight weeks of bananas and celery might start to feel like bread and water in a prison cell. <laughs> But it might also be bliss for you because it's just so easy. Yeah. And it might actually just be bliss because you're going to train real. You'll train like a champ, and you know weight won't be an issue, and you'll get you'll you'll learn a lot about bananas, and you'll learn a lot about yourself. That's great. And uh, um, be willing, I, to I, I, the, be willing to come off the program if it just gets to a point where you need something else and. And have celery and I've got a suspicion yeah. as to who that man was. I guess you don't want to mention. <laughs> so. It doesn't matter. It's, right. a com it's a common human thing. Sure, sure, sure. Just we, you know, we think we're gonna. Yeah. You know, we think we're gonna want it for life, and then it turns out we want other stuff. And yeah. It's just that's okay. It it it's just part of who we are. And and we just have to remember why are we doing what we're doing? Yeah. So if you're motivated for some big race and you can stay that motivated, um, you know, bless you. But if you get to the point where you go, I don't want to see any more celery. I want lettuce. I want tomato. I want something with an acid bite. You know. Well, that's that's what I would miss if I was just on bananas and celery. Is the acid bite of a mango or any of the fruits like that that's something that i enjoy is that understandable it's totally yeah. understandable and then you have to think again you know are you focusing on what you miss or are you focusing on what you want right so helen's helen's very good at focusing on what she wants great and uh, harriet as well is going to be at the uk fruit festival and sorry so didn't we, sorry harriet yeah and i'm just going to i'm just going to um I'll just mention that briefly. We'll talk about that a little bit. That's happening in about a month's time, 5th of August to the 9th of August. That's an event that I started last year. Doug's always been a supporter of the event and attended last year. He's going to be back this year with his wife, Rosalind, Grant Campbell, another member of the food and sport team. And Jake Ironmonger is a chef, and he was trained by yourself, Doug, and has been at a lot of your events as well. So, yeah, yeah. Jake yeah. Culinary Skills Week. He did a great job at Culinary Skills Week. Um, I look forward to eating his food at your event. I'm sure he'll. He's got a. He's got a wonderful way in the kitchen for anybody who wants to uh, volunteer to be an assistant in the kitchen. They're gonna. They're gonna be in for a treat working under Je under Jake's tutelage. Yeah, there's maybe one or two spaces left for volunteering. Perhaps uh, the spaces are limited for for bed for beds and bedrooms but there are some spaces left so i would encourage anyone who's interested in coming to sign up tonight especially as the prices are going to rise again tonight so if you want to lock in and freeze at the price currently on the website which is fruitfest.co.uk that's fruitfest.co.uk if you want to check that out there's a video there more information and really encourage you to try and sign up as soon as possible and and prices change tonight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna prices are gonna go up again tonight. So if you register for night, oh, they do. <laughs> yeah, and but Ronnie, if if somebody attends the event and then they decide they want to spend some time in the kitchen, they're going to be allowed to do that too, won't they? Yeah, they can do that. They can do that. And if anyone wants to bring any equipment they've got, anything that they don't know how to use. We can get you some time with Jake. If you want to spend some time in the kitchen or help out, you can do that as well. So, And there is also, for people who live nearby, there's been people who have contacted me from the area. It's, it's in West Sussex, Poolborough in West Sussex. Anyone in that area, anyone who can get there comfortably for the day, anyone who wants to come for the day as a day trip, there's also opportunities to do that. But I'll, I, would, I would suggest you... It's two and a half miles from the train station to the yeah. uh, event site. I, I clocked it the other day. And it's two and a half miles to the from the from the station itself. Right. Not right. far at all. So so for Harriet that's about a ten minute run and 
for other people that's maybe a <laughs> half hour, four minute walk, whatever that is. Harry, Harry's going to bring a barbell and some 140 <laughs> kilos of Olympic weights. Right, right, sure. that'll, that'll slow her down a little. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I do want to encourage everyone, anyone who wants to come to check it out, come along, message me. I've got my phone number on the site. You can phone me later on tonight after this hangout is is finished and speak to me about whatever your worries or fears are or anything. But um, what's what's your history, Doug, in terms of going? You've been to a lot of events, and what's been your what do you think are the advantages of going to these things? Did you when you were originally getting into raw foods? Did you go to events and meet people and? Was that a big part of it for you? That crazy. That, that was huge for me. Attending the lectures, for me, um, I attended a ton of lectures. And anything I couldn't attend, I, I usually they used to use audio cassette back in those days. But I would get the full audio cassette pack as well so that I could listen. Because in the same way as this webinar began with you reading something that I wrote, uh, I listened to these presenters and... And the gems of insight, everybody brings a gem with them, at least a few gems with them. You know, they might talk for 40 minutes, but in that 40 minutes, hopefully, hopefully they've expressed a few gems that, that were meaningful. It's funny because different parts of it will be meaningful to different people. So you don't know when you're saying something that's going to be incredibly powerful uh, for someone else. Uh, you might think like, you know, you came in with this great quote or you came in with this great insight <laughs> and something else is what really affected them. Uh, and I've always been surprised. I never know what it's going to be up to the point where I don't know. But that's a huge part. The, the educational presentations is a huge part. The meals are, are fantastic. I think you make more friendships and more commitments and more realizations just eating the food without it being a class, without it being a demo or anything. It is a demo in and of itself when you see how other people eat because, you know, they're giving you food that's representative of how they think you would do well to eat. Um, and so it, it's different with a food and sports staff member at the helm in the kitchen than it would be with just a raw food chef because they're really think doing the thinking for you, trying to put together or putting together meal choices that they would eat at their house and that they would recommend that you eat at your house in order to succeed eating a low-fat, high-carb, 80-10 hand style uh, raw food diet. So, um, I, don't, I was, I was just... social times, just yeah. the whole camaraderie, the friendships, uh, all the different kinds of classes that exist. I, I always pick up new things and learn new things from people when I'm when, still when I attend, but certainly as a beginner, uh, coming there, the, just being immersed in it where you say, oh, I don't have to think about what to eat for the next four days. It's going to be done for me, and it just gets you on a roll. You talked about it yourself, Ronnie, that it, you know, you, you're know you there at an event, and all of a sudden you're just – you could take it home with you and realize that if you just keep doing what you were doing there, it'll just keep working. I think when you when you're around people that have been doing it a lot longer than you have, when you actually meet people, and the, you said something about commitment there, and it becomes re more real when you're around people and you see it's they're not superhuman, they're not doing something complex, they're not they're just doing what's in the books, what's in the in the lectures that you're saying, and. Do you start to realize, yes, that's what I want that, what that person has, what that. Uh, and, and having having been to quite a lot of raw food, uh, 8, 10, 10 style events myself, I, I've said to people that, you know, the, the people that I've met have been really superheroes in many ways. And I've, I've got pictures of myself and on one side I've got a guy that's going to the Olympics on the other side, I've got a guy who's an ex-professional triathlete. You know, on and on, ultra marathon runners, all these guys that I've, I've never the potential uh, of what people can do. You had Alan and Jeanette last year who ran a marathon every day for 300 and 
65 days. I mean, stuff like that. People don't realize that's even possible to do that. And coming to events and seeing that really expands and changes your mind because you realize they're not any, they're not superhuman or anything like that. At the same time, you've got the people that recovered from cancer, recovered from kidney disease, recovered from so many life threatening conditions. And they found this information, they took it to heart, they implemented it, and they don't go around shouting the rooftops off about how they're cured from anything else. They just live their life and they uh, are an example to people, but you wouldn't even know it. They're not trying to make money out of it. They're not trying to uh, tell everyone else to do it or anything like that, which is maybe a shame in some ways. But so many people like that have these amazing stories and it's the, that that had a huge effect. Um, what well, was also Everybody's say, got a story. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's got a story. We're all pretty amazing when other people hear our story. Uh, you know, when I when I look at when I look at you and, and I hear the story of you know, I remember seeing you, you know, I go to a raw food event and there you were, and then I go to another one and there you are, and I go to another one and there you were, and we're going around the world and I'm going, Who is this guy? <laughs> but you see what it did to you yeah. Partly, it helped you become who you are now yeah you have all that experience and if, if people want to succeed on a on a raw food program I think retreats and events and festivals is a huge part of it you see other people doing it you realize you're not alone you're not a freak uh, so, somebody in every family has to go first and it's a great way to learn the to learn the right way rather than having to make all the mistakes on your own and 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 as you're saying you didn't just kind of arrive on the earth with all this knowledge you i remember you telling me you had a garage full basically of cassettes from all of the conferences you've been to and things and i remember you saying that you had to get rid of them because you didn't have any place to put them and and your your wife rosalind was kind of despairing at all this information that had been lost all these lectures <laughs> she didn't even want to hear about it it was it was so such a sensitive subject to her that you'd uh, you kind of lost these tapes you know probably close to a thousand lecture presentations wow that's and is that from the the natural hygiene society and places like that and Natural Hygiene Society, North American Vegetarian Congress, American Vegan Society, European uh, Vegetarian Society, the World Vegan uh, World Vegetarian Congress. Because I was lecturing at all those different places. Uh, um, um, the Animal Rights, the Farm Organization. Um, you know, all, all sorts of different places. You never knew where you were going to... I'm committed that not only am I a student still, but that everybody is my teacher. I can learn something from everyone, and I, and I hope that, you know, I, I, I know that will never end. I just want to stay in touch with that side of it, that everybody's, everybody's a teacher to me, and... And hanging around with the people who have what you want is the way for you to get it. It's the best way to get it is associate with the people who have what you want. I'm looking forward to this year's crowd. It's going to be a great festival, Ronnie. Yeah, uh, I, I'm also very much looking forward to it, getting a lot of good feedback from people who are coming along. Um, it's, it's been very, very popular this year. It seems like a lot of people are interested in coming. And we were discussing this the other day that there's been some people that have said to me they don't think there's a market for an event like this, so they don't think there's uh, interest in this kind of event or in raw food and things, but it seems like certainly from this year's event, it looks like it's going to be busy. It looks like it's going to be popular. Uh, I think the market is only growing. There's, there's festivals in the States. There's festivals in... Spain, Sweden, Denmark, Israel, uh, Brazil, 
Um, there's several other people talking about festivals next year in Hungary and um, possibly another one in Sweden. Uh, there's there's the the lovely thing is that the low fat raw vegan the 80 10 10 style of eating is is definitely gaining popularity and the and the number of people who want to know about it uh is just growing all the time i think that the outreach for festivals is going to only continue to rise we've come to a point in human consciousness where veganism is i mean the number of vegans in the u.s doubled last year that's that's astronomical and and it's happening in many many places vegan vegan in the uk is gaining popularity uh, of course the pressure to become vegan is also on the rise because governments are realizing they they can't just keep paying for the animal industry to keep happening while, <laughs> while at the same time the the compassionate side of people is realizing more and more that you know there's it really doesn't matter what kind of animal you're killing, uh, you know, having, having dogs and cats for pets and eating pigs and chickens is not making sense to a growing number of people. Yeah. And someone was saying, I saw a statistic that said that they reckon the 400 million less animals had been killed last year than the year previous to that or which is a first which is pretty amazing first that the numbers are going down got another got another question here this is from kira and the question for you is when i eat a large fruit breakfast whether whole form or blended i always feel extremely thirsty lightheaded and feel a bit sick and can't stomach the idea of having more fruit for lunch when i do i continue to feel this way so i end up eating my large salad for lunch and falling off the high fruit plan. What could be causing this? Any suggestions regarding how to tackle this? Uh, I make sure I drink a liter of water before breakfast and I add a lot of greens to my smoothies for added minerals. So I'm confused by my body's response. Uh, many thanks for your time. Um, also, I struggle to find organic fruits. Do you think large quantities of non-organic continuously could pose a problem nutrition wise? Thank you. That's uh, I this isn't the place for private health coaching, but certainly if you find yourself getting thirsty by the amount of sugar in the fruit you eat, uh, you have to add more water into your program. Sometimes people feel greater need for, for water. You have, sugar requires water in order to dilute it down to an acceptable level in our body. One, one way to deal with the sugar better is to be physically active before you eat if you're if you're physically active especially if whether it's got an element of intensity or endurance to it either one or both uh, will increase your body's ability to take the sugar that you consume or the sugar that you consume once it gets into your bloodstream to get it back out of your bloodstream put it somewhere because where it's got to go is it's got to go to the muscles and and it won't do that unless you've already created demand so i would say that although drinking water is a nice plan before eating if the sugar has nowhere to go it's going to be in your bloodstream and that's when you're going to get these tiredness lightheadedness um not wanting more fruit kind of sensations as far as eating salad for lunch a lot of people do that and there's nothing wrong with that they they find that they do better with fruit for breakfast, salad for lunch, and then fruit for dinner. I don't find that works well for me, um, although I'll occasionally eat some vegetables at lunchtime, some lettuce and some celery or even cucumbers. It, it doesn't really work well for me uh, to have a salad meal. I, I want more carbohydrates in my day so I can be active all day long, and then at the end of the day when I want volume, I'll eat my vegetables. But even then, I have fruit before my vegetables or, or fruit in my salad. Um, I don't know if, that, if that's enough. As far as the organic issue, 
I would say, <laughs> hi. Hello, <laughs> Jessica. Say hi to Ronnie in the world. Hi. <laughs> been away for a week. Crazy. Okay, Crazy. take her, take her, take her, take her. I'm, I'm just almost done. Um, as far as the organic issue, I think organic is hugely important. Uh, it would have been easy to say whole fresh ripe raw plants and leave out the organic issue, not take a stance. But I think organic is hugely important. I think that eating herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, insecticides, rodenticides uh, is never a, it, it can't be considered a health plan. It's Russian roulette. Um, and if it's a Russian roulette you want to play, well, fine. Uh, it's not one I want to play. Uh, I, I know at, at my age that it's going to have less of an effect on me than it would on a young person, certainly for, like, for my daughter. Um, I want her eating as much organic food as humanly possible. We try to get her everything organic, but if we can't, we're very particular about which foods we do and don't use organic. So, I mean, berries are always organic. Our greens are always organic. Uh, a lot of foods are easy to get organic, like bananas, so we do. And I think they're better. You know? um, you all the stone fruit, apples, pears, that sort of stuff, it's all organic. Uh, sometimes citrus is sometimes difficult for us to obtain organic. It's not as big of an issue, I don't think, uh, being thick-skinned fruit. If, if you saw the way citrus is grown, even the organic citrus, I mean, they're using, they're using stuff that's, um, you would raise an eyebrow if you saw what, what went on. But it's thick skin fruit. It's, it's a whole other world of what can be done. Um, to me, I think organic is, is, you might as well just ask, well, is raw an issue? Yes. In terms of quality of food, organic matters. It's a, it's a cumulative poisoning. Right. That's a pretty clear answer on that. Uh, but probably just going to bring it to an end soon, maybe another 10 minutes. So what's something I was interested in asking you? You said, you, you were saying, obviously, earlier, you're always learning. What, what have you been learning recently? What new research have you come across? What, what new information have you come across that's interested you? Well, I've been learning. I've been learning, actually, some of the latest research I've been doing is, has been about the way we store complex carbohydrates in our body, uh, how many different places those, it's known as glycogen, when we, when we convert roughly 30,000 units of, of simple sugar into one unit of glycogen, it's a complex sugar, a uh, complex sugar molecule, and we keep that in in more places in the body than we're commonly aware. Uh, not only is it is it used in more places, but it's it's um, converted to glycogen and converted from glycogen in more places. So I've just been I've been looking more into how how do we um, make use of it and and the chemistry behind that to me is very fascinating. Uh, it's been it's been a, I've been trying to look at and learn to, in order to become fluent enough to be able to express to others what are the different ways that our body actually fuels itself because we have different rather complex fueling systems and I don't want to go into teaching all that biochemistry of adenosine triphosphate and some of the some of the stuff that goes on with phosphocreatine and, and it just becomes becomes magnificently complex biochemistry um, i'm trying to get a, a, enough handle on it to be able to express it simply to people so they can understand which muscle fibers are fueled by different fuels or different fuel systems if you will they're all by the same fuels but different different ways of manufacturing it so uh, this this has been a, an area of, of research for me lately finding out is part of it but be but you know, it's one thing to find out to an air to till you're satisfied it's another thing to be able to find out to a point where you can 
explain it to other people. <laughs> That's the challenge, is can I explain it to other people? You have to pretty well own it to be able right. to explain it. Yeah. And, and, and what's new for what you're doing with, uh, with food sport and uh, your, your events coming up and other things you're doing, what's in your calendar and what's, what are you offering to people out there? Well, of course, we're having we're having our our biggest summer ever at Food and Sport. We're going to be offering eight weeks of events, six different six different events uh, that are open to the public, from our beginners eighty ten ten um, food and lifestyle beginners program. It's a three day program uh, to our we're doing conquering diabetes and our standbys health and fitness week and. Culinary Skills Week. Uh, we're going to have our magnificent, magnificent Goddess Week, which I'm really thrilled to be part of that. And I, I do a bit of lecturing and a bit of teaching in that program, but mostly we let the ladies run that whole program. It's a ladies' week uh, where they can really let go and learn and, and find out about things that there's really no place else to talk about the things that get discussed at, at Goddess Week. And um, so I'm excited about that. We're going to have a bit of a, a family reunion as well for, for people who are part of the 801010 family, as well as, as well as some private events, some staff weeks and some filming weeks. But uh, that's, that's exciting. I think more exciting even perhaps than that whole schedule, which is information available on my website, is the fact that I'm going back out on tour for the first time in ages and ages. And it's been... It's been probably 10 years since I've been on tour and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that because this time the entire tour is going to be uh, done right from here. This will be the background, uh, but I am going to go out on lecture tour, uh, presenting on a variety of topics over the upcoming months and start bringing, instead of just questions and answers and, and some of the things I've been doing with webinars are actually creating lecture series. Uh, to help people reach specific goals, you know, focus topics, do a night, do a long presentation followed by questions and answers. But it'll be lecture tour, basically a uh, virtual lecture tour, and that's really exciting. So, so how, how does that work? Will there be a live audience in other parts of the world? Is that what you're talking about? There'll be a live audience around the world. Uh, of course, we'll... we'll record them so that people can then access them after the lecture but after the lecture there's always special we have special offerings free ebooks reduced prices on products um, enough to make it usually enough to make it pay for itself several times over to i think it's easier for people in many ways to attend a lecture at their desk than it is even to go to a lecture in their hometown or something that's half an hour away, uh, to have to drive a half an hour to go arrive early and, you know, sit in an audience full of people for what they can get right in their own home. Uh, yeah. We'll be talking about topics from fitness to diabetes to uh, weight management to emotional eating and, and topics that are of you know, focused concern. People have written in time and again with specific questions. Those are the things that we're creating topics to go out and tour with things that are meaningful to people. Excellent. Well, yeah. Doug, well, Doug it's, um, it's been great to speak to you. I've got a list of all loads of things we didn't even touch upon. We'll uh, do it again next time, Ronnie. Yeah, we'll have to do another one some point. And, and just to confirm for everyone, to get more of information for what Doug's doing, foodandsport.com is the website. The blog is there. There's the, the 801010 forum where Doug's answering questions on a daily basis. Just, by the way, I'm, I don't work for Doug or anything like that. This is just information I want to share to get people, because a lot of people probably aren't aware that some of those resources are there. There's a blog there with lots of uh, really great articles. The 81010 forum, if you want to ask more questions of Doug, you can go there. And uh, and yeah, Doug's coming to the UK Fruit Fest this year, fifth to the 9th of August. Still, some places left. It is getting quite limited. 
prices are going up tonight. So register tonight to, to get to try and get your the, your space at, at the fruit and your get the price frozen where it is now, uh, rather than registering later on and and paying a bit more. So it's going to be five days. It's an eight uh, eight ten ten style program, hundred percent raw. Hit, uh, lectures, food demos, more lectures, workshops, and social activities. A big emphasis on sure. getting people fitness to meet classes. each other. Fitness classes as well. A lot of a lot of great social interaction. And I think even for the people who can't come for the full five days, that you're going to offer day rates, Ronnie. There is day rates available for people. Uh, unfortunately, just to say that people who are looking to stay over for a number of days we really need to reserve the space the accommodation for people that are going to be at the full event so if you if you want to come for one day or two days that's that's fine but you will need to find your own accommodation off-site uh, i believe there's probably various places in the area there's uh, lots of reasonable b and b's um, yeah. there's, there's some reasonable camping around there's some camping as well that's great because people have asked about camping we can't offer camping on site because of the the rules of the the venue, uh, but if there's camping off site, that'll probably help for people. Sure. Um, so we really want to make it possible for you to come. If you have any questions, we're not trying to make it harder for you to come. We want to make it easier for you to come if possible, but uh, with, within reason. Obviously, there's maybe a couple of volunteer spots left, possibly. Um, so please sign up as tonight as soon as possible. You can phone me. There's more information on the website fruitfest.co.uk, and we just want to make sure the people that, that need to be there, that want to be there, that want the information, that have that thirst for the knowledge, that have that desire to change, uh, that we we want you to get there and 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 get your questions answered, get your concerns answered. Um, get you having an absolutely fantastic time because these type of events are are just amazing in their power to change people's lives and that's why i started the event it's certainly not a it's not my job it's not a full-time thing it's just something that I started from my own passion of doing it and i'm learning how to do it as i go along we we did well last year we had a really good crowd of people last year the people that helped out everything seemed to go well so hopefully want to improve upon that this year and just make a make an impact and, and that's the goal anything i know you're more, going to be more than twice as big this year as last year that's uh, correct yep that definitely and i'm going to do everything i can to support you i look forward to seeing you and everyone who's here everyone who attends the uk fruit fest i'll be available the whole five days and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that great time. Thank you again for having me on board today. People want to know more about what I do. They can go to foodandsport.com. It's 10 letters, the word food, the letter N, the word sport. Hey, thanks a lot, Doug. Any, any last message you want to leave people with? I would encourage people to live up to their highest expectations of themselves. Right. Thanks, Doug. Today we were, we were speaking about health freedom. I hope everyone got a lot out of that. And thanks for joining the call. If you want to see another one, I'm sure we can do another one sometime. Please leave your comments below, leave your questions, subscribe to the channel, and, and share this around with other people you think might be interested in getting this information. You can share this video with anyone you like. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, everyone that's watching. and. We'll see you later on.